Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'll ask everyone to please take your seats and we'll get started. Good morning to everyone here in the room and everyone joining us across the country on the live webcast. My name's Doug King. I'm president of the Museum of Flight. Welcome to the Charles Simone Space Gallery. Charles is with us this morning. Charles, what a great day to talk about space. Did you have any idea that this would happen when you helped create this room? There are way too many people in the room to thank today for what's going on. You'll be meeting a lot of them, but I do have to introduce one person primarily responsible for the creation of this and so many other good things here at the museum, the chairman of the Museum of Flight, Mr. Mike Hallman, who's sitting right over here. You know, our mission here at the museum is to be the foremost educational air and space museum in the world. And what a better day to demonstrate what that's all about. You know, if you can join us later in the day across the bridge, you're going to find some of the most iconic aircraft that tell the story of the first century of flight, of the people who were brave enough after thousands of years of dreaming about it to step into the sky and change the world that we lived in. Just outside this door, you're welcome to join uh, to look at the Air Force One, the Concorde, uh, the first 747, the first 737, and really understand how far we've come in just a little over 100 years. But what we're probably most proud of is to use those artifacts and those stories of the people who designed and flew and, and changed our world to inspire that next generation, those young people that will write the story of the future as humankind steps off the planet. And so just beyond the tree line, on the other side of the iconic airplanes out here, you'll see some steel. That's Aviation High School, Raysbeck Aviation High School, coming out of the ground so that at this time next year, 400 young people will come to high school right here at the Museum of Flight. And I'm thrilled that... <laughs> I'm thrilled that that relationship is already paying off. You know, the high school exists now in a, in a really difficult situation down near the airport, but they're great kids and a great faculty, and that doesn't slow them down at all. And five of them will be working as interns this summer for Planetary Resources. Can you imagine getting to work on what we're talking about today when you're in high school? And so we'll invite you back as this gallery is transformed into the place that tells the story of the last 30 years of space and what we learned and how we built the base for what we can talk about today. We won't be able to host many events like this because you'll notice some blue lines on the floor all the way from near the door over there to the window over there. That's the outline of something called the full fuselage trainer the full-scale shuttle mock-up that will occupy this space beginning June 16th. We'll invite you all back when the crew compartment arrives. We got the first element behind you there uh, just last week, one of the engine bells from the shuttle mock-up. And we'll be thrilled to be using that as an educational tool to tell the story of what people like Tom Jones and the, the other 350 people who flew on the shuttle accomplished in the last 30 years that now allows us to move forward. And we'll also be telling the story of the entrepreneurs, the commercial space folks, the explorers that will continue to, to push back the boundaries at NASA that will make that happen for all of us. We're really excited that that story has such a Seattle flavor to it. You know, uh, when Lori Garver from NASA, the deputy administrator of NASA, was here for a future forum in December and introduced us to planetary resources and a lot of other young companies, we were struck with how many of them are here in Seattle. Lori used a uh, a, a way to think about this that she said that probably an analogy that this is probably closer to what happened in the personal computer industry than anything else she could think of. There was a time in the late 70s when people would say to you, why would you want a personal computer? What would you do with it at home? And our paradigm changed a little since then. Well, today on the stage you're going to meet people who are rejecting the old paradigm of space and talking about how all of us will use it to change our planet. A lot of that's happening here in Seattle, as you'll learn today, and we're thrilled. Maybe we should start thinking of this as the Silicon Valley of space. Anyway, welcome. We'll, history will judge that, and today will be one of the milestones that it judges from. So we're here today um, to make a pretty exciting announcement, and let's get started by giving you an introduction in video to planetary resources.
everything we hold of value on Earth, metals, minerals, energy, water, real estate, are literally in near infinite quantities in space. Planetary Resources mission is to gain access to the natural resources of space by mining near-Earth approaching asteroids. With technological advances that are coming out of exponential technologies and investors willing to bear the risk, small teams are now able to do what only governments and large corporations could do before. Our vision is to catalyze humanity's growth both on and off the Earth. We're breaking new ground. Now is the time for us to gain access to these resources. And at the end, the entire human race will be the beneficiary as we expand our reach beyond the Earth into the solar system. We've been searching for near-Earth objects mainly to assess the hazard of an impact on the Earth. It turns out that most of these asteroids are not a threat to the Earth, but they do offer potential benefits. They're in Earth-like orbits that offer accessible resources that we can tap into, both for scientific knowledge and returning those strategic supplies to Earth. Our plan for opening up the resources of the solar system is threefold. First, we're going to identify all of the most valuable near-Earth asteroids, where they are, what they're made of, and how to reach them. Second, we're going to develop the technology and the capability to transform those resources into valuable materials. And third, we're going to deliver those materials to the point of need, whether it's a fuel depot orbiting the Earth or elsewhere in space. Our small and focused team will enable the commercial exploration of the solar system. We're using experts who gain their experience in NASA and the tech industry, and we're keeping our goals simple and clear. We have a need now for the knowledge of what's on these asteroids, their potential resources in space, and the government is taking a scientific and measured approach to exploring them. We can really increase the knowledge that we get and the pace at which it comes back to us by involving commercial innovation and commercial visits to these asteroids. We are going to change the way the world thinks about natural resources. Logistics today will be simple. We're having a press conference here for the next hour. The press conference will last until about 11.45. You'll hear from all the speakers uh, on the podium here. And then the press will have the opportunity to ask questions, as will those people watching online. We'll take a short break at about 11.45, where the press can ask questions more directly. Uh, the rest of us can use the restroom, which is to the right over here. And then we'll reconvene at 12 o'clock for lunch. Those of you staying for lunch will have a chance to hear uh, Chris Lewicki and Tom Jones again, elaborating a bit on what we talk about in the press conference, then to ask questions of them. And at 1.30, we'll adjourn across the bridge to our gift shop where there'll be a book signing, Peter Diamandis and Tom Jones. So let's get on with it. Our first speaker today probably needs no introduction to this audience, but it's always a thrill for me to get to introduce him anyway. I first met Peter back in about 1995 when he was giving a talk in Washington, D.C about something called the X Prize. He had just read Charles Lindbergh's book, The Spirit of St. Louis, and was thinking about what it takes to really incentivize innovation in any field, and proposed that maybe this is a way that could get the rest of us to space. Well, you know the results of the X Prize and what Bert Rutan and Paul Allen did eight years later. So Peter's thinking this way goes way back. He has an undergraduate degree in genetics and a graduate degree in aerospace engineering from MIT, a medical degree, <coughs> excuse me, a medical degree from Harvard. He wasn't busy enough doing all that, so he founded the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, which now has chapters on campuses all over the country. He founded the International Space University, which now is an, a permanent campus in France, and recently founded Singularity University, a very exciting new project that all of us can participate in. Uh, on the company side, he's a founder of Zero-G, 
of space adventures and now, of course, of planetary resources, probably best known for being the chairman and CEO of the XPRIZE Foundation, which is addressing both space issues and human issues all over our planet. He's now a best-selling author of the book Abundance,